What's going on, guys? Joe McCall. This is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. How you doing? Glad you're here. Listen, it's been an exciting week. Those of you that, uh, as I'm recording this right now, you're watching us. We're doing a live challenge where we are actually documenting live how to flip houses in virtual markets and flip vacant land. So I'm doing this with my coaching business partner, Gavin, and um, he's doing houses. I'm doing vacant land. We're going into a brand new virtual market that we've never done before, and we're documenting the whole process, which is exciting. So if you, depending on when we're releasing this, uh, you could probably go to my YouTube channel and see the videos. Just go to the YouTube, do a search for Joe McCall, and you'll see the videos in there. We have a new playlist probably titled New Market Challenge. So go check that out. We're just documenting the steps A through Z on how to do this. And our goal is to get a house or land deal under contract, a really good one, in 30 days or less. And I'm a million times confident I can do that with land. Super easy. Gavin, I'm a little nervous about. <laughs> just kidding. With houses, we'll see. All right. So I wanted to tell you something. We got a cool guest on today. His name is Travis King. And we're going to be talking about scaling your land investing business. Travis has been doing land longer than I have. He's a beast. He's got a great reputation in the industry. And he was recommended to me by a friend. And I wanted to get him on because I've seen him around for a long, long time. So we're going to bring on Travis here in just a minute and talk about more about vacant land investing. I want to let you know right now, I have a free contract that you can get your hands on for free. This is the main contract I use for my vacant land deals. And if you want it, it's a one-page contract. You can get it for free, no strings attached, at simplelandcontract.com. Go there, opt in, get my contract. We'll send it to you in an email. And then on the next page will be a little invitation to watch a class that I did that teaches you how to use the contract. So again, it's free. Go to simplelandcontract.com and get your hands on it. Cool? All right. Are we ready to bring Travis in? Travis is a uh, good friend that I just met but I've heard about him for a long, long time. Travis, how are you, my man? Hey, Joe. Great, man. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. Welcome to the podcast. Um, I've seen your name around for a long, long time. You've been doing land investing for a long time. You're still active in the business, doing lots of deals. So congratulations to you. Um, let me ask you some questions, if it's all right, about land. How did you get started in land? What were you doing before? Oh, yeah. Well, um, the, the the irony here is that let's let's rewind here and I'm dating myself right back in like 99 or a year out of high school. Um, ironically, I did a land deal. You know, I did my first subdivide land deal up in wow. um, from Montana. Um, actually, did a, a 40 acre subdivide um, into five eight acre parcels. Um, but it was kind of something that uh, my dad helped me out on, and that he was um, he subdivided. He did land. Okay, so. Yeah. It was kind of like, you know, he, he kind of cheated up for me, right? And I didn't really appreciate it at the time or, or really understand it. And uh, um, houses and house investing, right, were a lot sexier and a lot more attractive to me than than walking land. And, and this is traditional. Like, this was walking land, right? This was in the county we lived in. Um, so as far as walking the land, I um, I wasn't real excited about land or land investing and definitely wasn't introduced to me as like a, a business model of flipping land. Right. right? You know what I mean? This? This was 1999, right? Oh, I, I mean, yeah, so this is right out of high school. Um, I did that first deal and uh, and then kind of moved on, right, to um, start career. But really, uh, that was the solo land deal. And that's kind of the funny part of it because then it really focused on houses, you know, and house okay, investing yeah. for the next decade or okay. so. And, and we kind of all know how, right, the 2008, when I say the next decade, right, from yeah, 99 yeah. to 2000 to 2008, we all know how that story ended. And for me, it, it ended in um, my wife or fiance at the time, you know, like the 2008 crash, you know, it ended in uh, a, a condo we had being foreclosed, um, both of us losing our jobs in a matter of six months. Um, Where were you living at the time? We were in, so I'm from Montana, I, I traveling for work and I was actually in Northern California. So I met my wife down in Sacramento area and that's where I was working at the time. That's where she was working. Um, of course the, the, the bubble burst a little bit in some of those markets, you know, the ripple effects don't hit places like Montana or the Midwest till a little, little later. Right. But so for us it was more like the, the, 
um, the crash of the bubble of 2006 or seven. Everybody else refers to as 08, right? But it came a little early there. So yeah, for absolutely. so for us, that's kind of when um, you know I made the mistake of reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, getting all excited and. Um, but not really studying it. I say, right, skimming it, you know, it was enough to give me the motivation to get into houses, but not really be like a student of house. Investing. We we have a very, very similar story. I got into real estate around the same, well, 2005, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, got all excited and um, lost my shorts, lost a bunch of houses because I was way over leveraged. I was ignoring the fundamentals. I was yeah. counting on appreciation and I thought real estate always went up, right? But yeah. I, and I, that's how I feel. It's like, that one's on me. That's not on him. Yeah, because if you read yeah. the book, he talks about like buying cash flowing houses, right? So not like counting on appreciation. So that one's a hundred percent on me, but being, um, you know, being in your twenties, right. And, and naive and, uh, um, just taking that massive action. But like, I'm a fan of massive action, but not massive, like ignorant, uneducated action. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I took my lumps right there and then kind of went into like, more like retreat mode, I would say, you know, that my wife and I moved back to Montana somewhere I was familiar with, right? Kind of get the feet Let me just say, you live, you live in one of the greatest states in the country. I love, love, love Montana. I was just there two weeks ago. Went, flew into Kalispell. Yeah. Spent some time in and around Glacier. My son's there for a Christian uh, YWAM, Youth with a Mission yeah. organization for five months. I, I've been there probably two or three times Besides that, absolutely love Montana. I'm super jealous that you oh, live it's, here. It's incredible. Montana's incredible. Yeah, it's um, it, it's just amazing. And as you travel and tell people that, they go, why, why are you, when I used to travel around with my job, like, why are you here? You know, like people, you know what I mean? It's on people's bucket list to go up to Yellowstone and Glacier. Yeah. Some of these places, but when you grow up around it, you I think you kind of take it for granted. You don't really know. Um, but at the same time, as a young guy in his 20s, there's not a lot of job opportunity, right? Like if you're trying to build your empire, I don't know. That's where you go. That's where you go when you're ready to retire and fly fish and stuff like that. Right. Or, or buy a second home, but it, it's not the place that I would say that a young buck. Uh, yeah. Oh, where, 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 where do you live in Montana? I'm just curious. Uh, so we still have our house in uh, Missoula, which is okay. Southwestern Montana. Um, ironically, the image is Kalispell. My wife's family homesteaded. Um, like late 1800s, early 1900s, no up way. in Whitefish, which you know very close to Kalispell ski area now. So, um, yeah, my dad still lives up there. We relocated about three years ago down to Phoenix, so we still have a home in Montana. So we have two houses: our, our primaries here in uh, Phoenix area, and then we have a house in Missoula up in Montana. So you'd rather live in Phoenix than Montana. Well, it's kind of taking that long view, right? With the the kids, it's not where I want to be in the summer. That's for sure, right? But um, for more looking ahead at kids, you know, married yeah. three boys, and it's really um, opportunity colleges, and you know, um, everything from yesterday. We went to a preseason NFL game, you know, for the Cardinals. So, um, you know, that's just stuff in Montana. There are no pro sports. Can't take your. We used to drive down to Denver to catch a ball game. <laughs> you know, well, in okay. Montana, there's no teams. I, I don't know who uh, who just swept the Arizona Diamondbacks. Take your pick. I think everybody's had their turn, you know. Huh? That was the toughest thing. I'm trying to sell my kids on moving down to Arizona. He's like, Dad, have you looked at their the pro the record? I said, I'll take you to every pro team, a game for every pro team. He's like, Have you looked at that? The no, I'm sorry, I'm rubbing it in because the Cardinals, my St. Louis Cardinals, just swept the Arizona Diamondbacks. Yeah, they are, they're kind of a doormat right now, but you know, we're we're kind of um we're more beating our chest about the Phoenix Suns right now than, you know, <laughs> than baseball. That's for sure. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it can be a suffering contest up in these, these cold weather States. Right. And I grew up shoveling snow, scraping windows, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Some yeah. of those things. So as, um, as beautiful as it is in the, the summer and stuff and throughout the year, um, there's also, you know, a long cold winter, right. That you got to live with. So you all see right. a lot of people watch the movie Yellowstone, get all excited, you know, run up there and buy a house and, first snow hits and then they're gone right well you know it's funny i was wa i watch yellowstone and um you never see any dirt or dust on any of the trucks yeah the trucks are always spotless and clean and come yeah. on yeah yeah i can tell you that's that's not what it is right yeah it, that's people aren't driving those king ranch editions everywhere at the ranch <laughs> that's not spotless, a, like it gets your typical ranch but they probably us, have a full-time crew of a dozen people that just clean all of the trucks whenever they do any filming 
Well, yeah, exactly. Because nobody up there is concerned about how their truck looks to anybody else, right? That, that's the least of <laughs> the Montana way. That's the least of people's concern. But for us, it provided like at the time when I had moved down, I was living in Northern California, kind of a landing spot, right? Like a foundation for me yeah. to um, rebuild. Uh, at the time, it felt a little bit like retreat because of that crash and how hard we got hit. It just took the, the wind out of my sails, but it it allowed me to kind of like uh, start over and got yeah. married, started a family, right? Um, had our boys and um, it kind of started rebuilding. And then it was just uh, like most people, you know, um, commuting to that, uh, that Monday through Friday, nine to five, you know, and listening to podcasts, wanting to get back in the game of real estate, um, but also suffering from a slight case of PTSD, you know, from houses, right? And, and not wanting to dive back in. Yeah. You know, we started doing rental houses and stuff, but I was kind of running the math and I'm like, boy, I adore every two years. This isn't going <laughs> to I'm not going to no, hit my goals right. here. And so we wanted to get back into to real estate investing. And I was commuting and just heard a, a podcast one day and um, Seth Williams, you know, Mari Tipster was being interviewed. This is back in 2013, um, being interviewed on Bigger Pockets. Yeah. And he started talking about land flipping as a business model. Well, I had a familiarity with land from my dad and growing up and my dad had done some subdividing, done some land and I had done a deal, um, you know, but it had been uh, uh, 10, 12 years um, since I had. But, and, and then he was really talking about it as a model, right, as a business model, not like just going out and land investing or doing a flip, but like let's repeated flips and building a business. So I listened to the episode several times, reached out to Seth direct. Um, and, and actually, he was kind enough to reply to my email, you know, and give me some guidance. And I said, hey, dude, I'm, I'd love to buy your course. You know, where's the buy now button? And at the time, Seth was running his blog, you know, Ari Tipster blog. Yeah. And he said, I don't, you know, I don't have a course, right? He said, uh, you basically said, if you, if you print out all my, my blog articles and you put them in sequential order, you basically have a course. But you kind of got to duct tape together. And we were kind of, I think he's kind of joking, but I did that, right? I did just that. I printed them out. I put it together as my own course kind of ran through it. Um, and then, you know, I bought, there were two or three other courses out there at the time around the land, but but most of them were focused on like delinquent land yeah. flipping, delinquent investing. And it just, they all had their gaps, but I felt like between two or three of them and what Seth had, it kind of filled in all the gaps and gave it. It gave me a whole picture, but I think I also gotten that, um, that like paralysis by analysis where I was even at one more course, one more, I just need one more thing, right? One more piece of the puzzle, be confident to do this, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I don't know, looking back, I cost myself 50 or hundred grand that you're like being in education mode yeah, for a yeah. solid year. And then one day I, I was talking with my wife about it and again, right. And telling her about rural vacant land and, and we we're actually looking at um, bid for assets an online auction site. And I was telling her, look at these cheap lots. You know, you can buy these lots for like 500 bucks on online. She's like, I'm so tired of hearing you talk about this, right? Just buy it, buy it, do it. I don't know the worst could have, we could lose some money. Right. Yeah. Um, so we bought one. Um, I think we resold it for like 2,500 bucks. So, you know, not a big windfall, but it was like uh, buy for five or 600, sell for about 2,500 you know, less than 10 hours into it. So I'm like, Hey, this is, why couldn't we do this 10, 20, 50 times a year? You know, so I think I validated it. And once it was validated, um, once it was validated, then, then I'm like, okay, I'm good to go now. Now it's, it's more about like, um, how big can this get and how fast can we get it there? Right. Yeah. Once I knew it worked, but I, I, you know, like most people, I, I do a lot of coaching and training now and, and I know you do in a, I think that's common, right? With everybody is you just go, well, just one more course, one more piece of information, and then I'll be ready. Well, yeah, um, I can kind of poke holes in the courses. And the reality is for uh, 500 or $5,000, doesn't matter the cost of the course. You can't cover every single thing. You know what I mean? It's incredible yeah. value people deliver when they, they're willing to give you a course and put their distilled knowledge together. But, but you've got to have some confidence, you know what I mean? And you've got to take some action. And I think um, I cost myself a year that first year doing that. Um, but eventually, Hey, we got, we got started. Right. And then well, I can relate. I, I always say I was a professional student for three years before I started doing deals. Right. Cause yeah. I was just dabbling here and there. I would take what this guy did, what that guy did. I would try to do uh, at the time I was just doing houses. I would do wholesaling and lease options and subject twos and owner financing and short sales and foreclosures. And I was trying to do these all, all these different strategies. And 
Um, it wasn't until I just focused in on one strategy and got really good at it. And I did buy like three or four courses on wholesaling, right? Yeah. And I finally had that, that epiphany, like, you know what? I'm just going to do what this guy says to do, and I'm not going to change it. I'm just going to do what he says to do and trust the system. And that was when I started doing deals and having success. Not trying to change anything, not trying to add anything or take anything away. And this was a friend of mine, Chris Chico, and he had a wholesaling course on virtual wholesaling. And I just did what he said. I didn't like the postcards. I didn't like the list. I didn't like how he made his offers, but I yeah. did it anyway, right? Right. It's it's magic. It worked. I couldn't believe it. I agree. It. It's, it's, uh, I think, you know, John Lee Dumas, right, has a, a monster podcast. He always talks about focus, right? That follow one course until success. Well, like literally a course. That's what I said. You know what I mean? With us, you've yeah. got to follow a course. It doesn't matter whose course. There's maybe 10 yeah. different ones that, and, and they all work. It, it's really about like, you know, following that course and that system and, and that person's recipe, right? And you can get cute and you can switch things up and you can put your own spin on it down the road, right? You know what I mean? But to get started, um, why not? If somebody's, you know, you wouldn't buy a franchise and then rewrite their their um, SOPs, like their process manuals, right? If you found issues, like you follow it, you know? And yeah, I think yeah, that's exactly. the thing about a course is, is just like, um, following that course till you get that traction. And then if you identify areas to optimize, um, absolutely do that. But, but at first, um, yeah, just getting going, getting started and using somebody else's methods is, is the best route. Yeah. Good. All right. So you got started, you were buying these little lots for 500 bucks, selling them for 2,500. Is that what you said? Were you yeah. selling them? For cash or on owner financing, what were you doing there? No cash. Yeah. So we just did a couple. And at the time, like I say, I was taking, you know, courses and really what I was trying to tie together was um, there wasn't a bunch of data sources out there where you just got like single user licenses. There's all these like enterprise or business to business licenses to buy data. But there, there's like list source, I think was the only one I could find at the time where a guy could get a, you know, an individual membership and download a list. So the teaching of time was like, go to the county and get their delinquent tax list. And then it comes in this gobbledygook format. Then yeah. you reformat it and put together a direct mail campaign. Um, so for me, I was like, it just was like, I, I cut out all of that part of it that seemed kind of overwhelming by like identifying, you know, this bid for assets website and buying those individual lots on the auction. Um, but at the same time, like knowing, like just from a business perspective, like if you become reliant on one platform, right, what happens to that goes away or gets saturated, you know, um, and I, and the, the margins weren't huge there. Like, you know, I didn't, you know, making a grand or two grand is great, but like how many would you have to do a year? So I knew I had to figure out that, like that um, data set slash mailing list and then direct mail campaign piece of it. So that's kind of where I, I, I dove in and, and actually, uh, when I started, I used like county websites, like their GIS system or the parcel viewer. I would just like run a buffer and then download like an Excel list right off the county website. And in Arizona, it's really common where you can actually export uh, from the GIS website. You draw a circle um, or a polygon and you can yeah. download as an Excel list. Uh, you were talking about uh, you were going directly to the county websites, the GIS website mapping systems that they use and downloading these mm -hmm. lists yourself because it was hard to find a list of vacant land. Correct. Like there were there nowadays. Uh, so like when people ask, depending on market conditions or, or um, anything like what well, is now a good time to start? You know, uh, my wife and I, I kind of just chuckle because she works the business with me. And when we started, the, the tools weren't out there. Right. The tools weren't out there as a land flipper, a land investor. There's incredible data sources, you know, and CRMs and, and uh, just so many softwares out there right now that didn't exist. So, yeah, we would pull like our list from the county website, right, right off their viewer. And then we would uh, bring that into click to mail and we'd send a campaign. And so we were doing direct mail campaigns, targeting properties like very low end properties, like less than ten thousand dollar. At rural vacant land because that was kind of like the the courses I had been through were focused on that and quite honestly that was like our the our bank balance our play money that's all I had to play with right was, was I was only allowed to lose like four figures right not five figures with so I had to start really small and do small deals and we kind of just started one at a time with I mean buying things as cheap as a thousand reselling them like owner financing for three four five thousand you know on payment buying them um, you were sending neutral letters. 
Um, we were sending blind offers, so unsolicited, blind, including a price, but we would identify like pocket areas where the market value is very homogenous, like like kind, like size, you know, um, which is more common in the Southwest, you know, sure. to, to find um, these subdivisions with like 3,000 one acre properties, yeah. right? That, that it might be worth um, several thousand or 5,000. So we're kind of picking out these little, these uh, Hishcomb subdivisions, right? And just sending blind offers at the time. So not like letters of interest. Um, and we would, we would buy properties for as low as six, $700 up to 2000, you know, and then we'd sell anywhere from three to, to seven or $10,000. And then we'd sell on owner financing was um, our model in the beginning, really trying to build that, like that uh, empire of notes. Cause for me, the goal at the time was to replace job income so I could step away from job because um, family was grown, had two kids, you know, uh, planning a third. And it was it was like, OK, I want to spend time with these, you know, spend time with yeah. my family. I was traveling out of town, uh, starting to get tough on myself, on my wife, like missing out on things, being gone. So it was like, OK, I got to make this work. And um, I didn't really have the option of doing one big, massive flip. Right. With, and walk away with a bag of money. It was like this has to be like incrementally one owner finance deal at a time. Um, so that's really what we focused on the first two years because we were using our own money and just plowing our money back into it and doing more and more notes, right? Creating node income. And then eventually got to that point where about two and a half years into it, where um, there are no, our monthly note income was close to 10,000 a month. And that replaced my job income. Nice. And was kind of able to, to fulfill that dream. I think a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs, a lot of people have of, um, you know, um, stepping out, right. Exiting the job, um, and, and not like, and having some runway, right. Like, you know, exiting the job, but having that note income, there's the safety net. Nice. So do you think it took you two and a half years to get to that point? Could you, could you have gotten there faster if you would have put more time into it or if you would have had more money oh, or my gosh, I've got so many learning lessons. Yeah. So absolutely. And that I, I look back, you know, and like, um, there's just, you don't know what you don't know at the time. And I think the other thing is you quite often, like we, our goal, we set our goals, right. Based on either our current means, right. Like our current means or our current mindset. So we set yeah. small goals, my goal is never like a hundred thousand a month or a million a year. Like I couldn't even think that, you know, being in like an $80,000 million job. Like I couldn't even think of a million dollar year, what that would look like or bigger goals. Right. But 10,000 a month sounded realistic. You know what I mean? So you set those goals, you work towards them. Um, and then the other thing is like, I hadn't even like, where would you go to get money? Like I was using my own money, you know? So I'm like, it's not like the house industry where it's really mature and there was funders or hard money lenders all over the place. You'd say land 10 years ago and people would be like, huh, that stuff is terrible. I don't want to get stuck with that. Right. So for us, that was a big part of it, but I, I left the job and it felt like a, a big win. But what I didn't see coming was like the plateau because I had built up all these notes and they were small notes though. They were like 36 and 48 month notes because they were less than $10,000 deals. So what was interesting was like at year three, 36 months at that same clip, I was originating notes four or five a month, you know, uh, two, three years ago, they were now, uh, I was now experiencing note churn, right? They were dropping off. So I'm like hemorrhaging cash, you know, 550 a month losing note income. So that hockey stick growth we had early on was because we, you know, it was our first two, three years, you know, and we were originating these smaller notes. So a ton of takeaways from that. Right. And then now, like I teach people to build a note empire of like five to 15 year notes so that you're not combating churn. Right. And then the other thing is, um, as we had to rework our model about the same time we started to experience the pain of note churn, having left the job, I need to pay myself a salary now. Right. So I'm cannibalizing the business. You know what I mean? Instead of plowing all the profits in before, because I was living off a of job income, I'm paying myself a handsome salary, you know, and then I'm experiencing yeah. note churn. So, you know what I mean? So it's really like that scaling up. Um, so I identified, okay, this, this model doesn't work of these like cheap properties, seller financing, right? That's not going to work one. But at the same time, we realized that like, we had built up almost 500,000 in like a, a note portfolio, 
Um, but we had less than 10 grand in the bank account. Right. So it was like a humbling moment because it was like, am I a success or am I not? Right. What's going on here? Um, but it was really like not looking ahead and recognizing that. So we had identified all that node equity. It was, it was trapped, right? All that equity is trapped and not solvent. We couldn't get to it. So two things I realized, all right, I've got to retweak, redo our business. And then also I need to like, um, I've got to, you know, add a zero. I've got to do bigger deals. Um, I've got to do more cash deals and I've got to do bigger deals. Um, or, but then that's when we go, Oh, but I'm, I'm basically dirt rich, but cash poor. Right. So that became, okay. The next thing is, is other people's money. How do I get capital? So that's for me when I started really, and that's what circling back to answer your question. That's what I tell people right out the gate now is, you know, like, um, it's kind of like it's, this model works at every level. When I started, the way it was kind of presented to me was this is an inefficient market, which which it absolutely is, I agree, but it's an efficient inefficient market up to a couple million dollars in land. But as explained to me is we have this opportunity because agents won't take these listings. No agent wants some cheap land. It's a liability. There's no commission in it, but all the opportunity lies in the 30,000 or below market value, right? And it's completely untrue as we scaled up our business and we started to go, um, I lined up outside money, right? I lined up a funder, a capital partner. And then we started targeting values. We used to just pull data on like 30,000 and below values. We started targeting up to like 200,000. Mm-hmm. And these people had never received an offer before from a, a land flipper, right? Because nobody was targeting those. So it's like we we stumbled into like this blue ocean of higher value properties. And then when we do a flip, we're making 10, 20, 40 grand a deal instead of adding 150 a month note income. So yeah, that, that's kind of my takeaways to people is like, um, is and now you're fortunate because there's 20 different places you could go to, to JV or get your deal funded in the land community. Um, but I would say like, uh, don't avoid bigger deals because you don't have the money. There's tons of people. Joe will probably partner with you. Heck, there's, there's 20 different people that would um, work with you out there like, but don't limit the, the the value properties you go after based on your bank account, right? So go after bigger deals quicker um, and then leverage like real estate agents and title companies and really move away. Um, it's a, it's a method I teach is called the boss method. It's, it's for bigger deals offering more. So instead of like a, a 20, 25, 30% offer, we're probably more at 40% or 50% of market value because we're going after bigger stuff. But that's the B and the O. And then the S, it's first S is stop self-funding, like stop funding everything, right? Leverage a capital partner or funder and then stop doing it yourself. You know, like don't self-close on the buy side. Don't self-close on the sell side, right? Lose title companies, use land agents. And and this was all stuff like to save time. I know it's a long answer to your question, but if this I, is good. my wife and I both work the business together and we're almost 10 years in. So combined... You take the number of hours we've thrown at this business and the, the scaling points along the way. If I can kind of distill that and shave off your people, those are like those first tips, you know, when you're getting started um, is closing with title companies in the buy and sell side, selling with land agents. Um, and that'll put you at a price point that you you have to be doing bigger deals because there's not enough money in it. If you try to close with title companies, pay an agent on a small deal. So it's going to force you to do bigger deals um, and then identifying a capital partner so that you can go after deals and you, one, you put, you're not all the risk, you spread the risk. Um, But two, it just allows you to do bigger deals. You know, that, that's, I think the, the biggest takeaway. Um, So absolutely somebody could kind of start at like my year three, right? Year three or four. That's that would be like the starting point if I were coaching somebody. You know, it's not a like suffering is not a requisite to scale up and have a, a land. <laughs> you can like, you know what I mean? You could start here um, yeah. and, and get to where I am in half or a third the time if you don't go that route of uh, small deals and self funding and self closing. Yeah, um, for sure. I love it. So, you know, what, how do you target? those bigger properties that are worth like is there a what's the price range what's the acreage size or are you doing deals that are closer to bigger cities 
Yes, absolutely. So there's there's two like um, product types I'd call in our business, you know, where rural vacant land and then like residential lots. Some people call them info lots, but it's it's just like a residential lot. The end buyer is going to build a home on it. It's got utilities at the street, a paved road, right? So those are kind of the two products in our business we work with. Um, yeah. Rural vacant land, um, like under 100,000, under 80,000 is fantastic you could you create a that's really where we build like our node empire is selling properties like 30 to eighty thousand dollars in value um on a note with a 30 to 50 percent down so we really we some are going to sell cash some are but uh the majority sell seller financing so we really like to create our node income with rural vacant land um and then we, we like to do cash flips on residential lots in metro areas, you know, within an hour of anywhere, okay. uh, within an hour of pick a metro city, right? Like um, we just did with a client, a partner um, in Tampa area, uh, a $350,000 lakeside lot, right? Um, so that's why I say that it really works all over. We do a $3,500 lot in New Mexico, or you can do a $350,000 lot in Tampa, you yeah. know, um, it really works. So we go after residential lots and rural vacant land. But in me personally, like when I pull the data set, I don't separate the two. Um, I'm going to keep that like, so like acreage range, right? I pull my mailing list or, or uh, data set. I might say from quarter acre up to 52 acres. Um, and then I'm just focused on the value that I pull at, like everything below three or 400,000 value, right? Like. And that's going to give me everything because some rural vacant land is going to come back there because of that max acreage I put in. And then some infill and, and residential lots at quarter acre, two acre are going to come in there. Um, so I don't segment that because what happens, yeah. I found when you segment it, you end up missing out trying to run two different campaigns. Um, and it's just unnecessary to run two different campaigns. So, so yeah, we go after that quarter acre to about 52 acres is, is what we go after. Um, you know, if you're doing big ranches in Texas, obviously you would adjust that. But overall, that's kind of like our countywide criteria. All right. So we're you're still breaking up a little bit. We may need to break this up into two parts. So maybe uh, we'll wrap this up soon here and do a part two with you, Travis, because I have a lot of questions I love to ask you. Um, but just real quick, and, and let me ask you one more question. When you're sending mail to, you know, quarter acre lots and 50 acre lots, um, are you just sending a neutral letter then so you can get them on the phone and talk to them about the kind of property they have? Are you still sending blind offers to them? A um, little bit of both. And that will, like, if we're targeting like lakeside lots or we're targeting something with, if we're pulling a countywide list, there could be a big variance from one part of the county to the other, you know, in value per acre or per square foot. So something like a letter of interest or a postcard of interest where we're not committing to a price, it gives us time to like value it before we give an offer. It makes a lot of sense. So the higher the value, that works better. Um, but if if we find in like zip codes or subdivisions where there are a lot of similar size properties, they're easier to value. Yeah. Um, those are you know like better candidates for um, for blind offers. But a lot of the time, um, so we run both. Well, when somebody's new, a lot of times I'll tell them to lead with like a. A letter of interest, right, or a neutral, because they don't know pricing a campaign is um, something that takes a while to build that experience. So I think when somebody's starting out, like just sending a postcard of interest or letter of interest is, is the best route to go. As soon as you start yeah. to know your market or markets and you understand how to price a campaign, um, then you can blind offer. Um, I feel like that's probably the best route. But in our business, we we run both and we teach both. Yeah, I'm kind of on the same page. Like, especially with beginners, it's just just send out a neutral letter um, until you get familiar with the area. You get familiar with the subdivisions and the you know the certain unique things, and then you can send blind offers. Maybe your second time around or follow up or whatever. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'd say tell people based on the feedback from your campaign, you're actually going to learn your market or learn your county. You get two or three leads from the same subdivision or same area, and they're all telling you it's worth this. You know, like you you now kind of might identify areas to send a little micro mailer 
yeah. to a blind offer micro mailer. So sometimes leading with that countywide. Um, it's not when somebody goes, I didn't get a deal or somebody, I go, well, it's never wasted. You had to have learned something based on the feedback you got and yeah. those seller leads, right? So yeah, I'm, I'm same page with you on that. Awesome. Let's do this, Travis. Would you be open to doing another interview? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Cool. Yep. How can people reach you, get a hold of you? The easiest way is just go to travisking.com. Um, you'll, yeah, that's probably the easiest, fastest way to go there. I, I, you know, we, I run a mastermind. I have an advanced investors, um, course. I, I do group coaching. Um, we do, cool. um, you know, subdividing a lot, a lot of things having to do with scaling your land business up that, that we've learned along the way. Nice. Um, you know, doing portfolio deals, subdividing there, there's just a lot of those, um, um, things as we scale that I've now put into training content and, and share with people, but travisking.com works t-r-a-v-i-s travis king k-i-n-g.com perfect all right well listen guys appreciate you all being on the podcast i know we had some problems with the uh, internet connections there so my apologies but uh, we will do a part two i'll get with travis right now and talk about when we can go uh, do part two and uh, we'll see you guys later thanks everybody bye-bye all right thanks everybody thanks joe